Tonight we're looking at Galatians chapter 1, verses 3 through 12, and here we read the following. The Apostle Paul says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age, according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one that was preached to you, let them be under God's curse." As we have already said, so now I say it again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than the one that you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. I did not receive it from any man nor was I taught it. Rather, I received it by revelation from Jesus Christ. This is God's word. And again, this is a new week in which we are looking at uh, a new series. Uh, The series is on the Apostle Paul's letter to the churches in Galatia. And what that means is it's multiple churches, not one church. So it's different from Ephesus, it's different from Corinth, it's a collection of churches. It's uh, in, in the book of Acts, when you see the Apostle Paul go through missionary journeys, and he goes to Lyconium and Derby and Lystra and Pisidian Antioch. Those are the churches in Galatia. And the letter that he writes here is in the early 50s AD, approximately, and he's writing to churches that, so far as we can tell, seem to be a good mixture of Jewish and Gentile converts to Christianity. And the structure of the letter that he writes is very, very clear. Uh, even though in that day he didn't, like Paul didn't insert the chapters and verses into the Bible, we did that later. But what we call, the structure is still very clear. What we call chapters one and two are the Apostle Paul's personal testimonial. It's his like, autobiographical story of how he came to meet Jesus Christ and learn the gospel from Jesus. And then in what we call chapters 3 and 4, uh, the Apostle Paul teaches very specific doctrine. And specifically, it's the fact that salvation comes by grace through faith, not by works and the law. And then in what we call chapters 5 and 6, he gets very, uh, it's application. And so he talks about how we are now freed from Uh, all of the religious rules that have existed in the world's religions to this point, including Judaism, but that were freed for a specific purpose. And the specific purpose is God's call to uh, human moral design for flourishing. Okay? So we're going to flesh that out in the next couple of months and weeks, and we'll go through that whole structure again. The single biggest thing for you to know, though, the one thing that separates Galatians, and every Bible commentator will say this, from every single other Uh, letter that the Apostle Paul writes is actually uh, the fact that Galatians is a letter that is about the gospel. It's not just a proclamation of the gospel. It's about the gospel written to believers who are losing the gospel. It's about the gospel written to believers who are losing the gospel. That is precisely the reason why in the opening verses of this text, the Apostle Paul starts in a way that is really super unusual compared to all of his other letters and all of his other writings, and for that matter, ancient writings in general. He opens with a rebuke. This is, this is super unusual. I'll explain just in a second what I'm talking about. He says in verse uh, 6 in the beginning of 7, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. I'm rebuking you in the opening verses. Now, to put this in context, the Apostle Paul, when he writes to uh, the church in Corinth, which sort of functions like, I've always thought of it like the problem child of the Apostle Paul's church plants, like they they got a couple of issues along the way. He starts in his letter to Corinth by saying, I thank God for you and that he has made himself known to you and the things that he's doing in you and through you. And then he proceeds in the subsequent chapters to talk about how arrogant they are, uh, how idolatrous they are, 
Uh, their immorality, there's a guy who's having an affair with his stepmom. There's a bunch of members there who are frequenting temple shrine prostitutes all the time. Uh, they have all sorts of confusion about gender. They got, they got lots of issues, okay? Corinth's got lots of issues. But the Apostle Paul has all this flowery, uh, joyful, celebratory language as he greets them. I thank God for you all the time and what he's doing in you and through you. And then you get the Galatians, and it's like he woke up on the wrong side of the bed. You know, the Apostle Paul is coming in, like he's coming in hot, and he's like, I rebuke you. I've got no words of approval for you. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a festivist airing of grievances, for those of you who are Seinfeld fans. Let me tell you everything I don't like about you right now. You know? Uh, now, here's the question for us. How is it that the Apostle Paul would come in so hot and antagonistic against a group of people that, so far as we can tell, are probably morally cleaner than a church like Corinth? You know what the answer is? The answer is that the, the churches in Galatia were losing the gospel. Uh, did you see what he said here? He's like, you are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. That's the problem. Now, again, to answer that, like the best analogy that I could come up with for this, and I'm not sure it's a good one, but it's the best I could come up with, is why would he be more upset with people who are morally cleaner than other people in Corinth? The answer is like this. In hospitals, you serve sick people. You go to a hospital, you expect that you're going to serve sick, pe sick people. Now, I've learned from having a, a wife who works in healthcare that different hospitals serve different patient populations, and so some hospitals actually serve people who are more sick in some respects than other people. But the fact of the matter is, they're all sick. They're just sick to varying degrees, etc., from one hospital to the next. Therefore, the biggest threat to a hospital is not that somebody sick might show up, because that's why hospitals exist, for sick people. The biggest threat to a hospital is not that there might be sick people to whatever degree. The biggest threat to the hospital is that you might run out of medicine, right? Uh, regardless of how sick the people might be. Did you catch it? you understand the difference? The biggest threat to a hospital is not whether or not there are sick people there. The biggest threat to a hospital is whether or not you run out of medicine, regardless of how sick the people are. The Galatians, in many respects, have morally cleaner lives than the Corinthians, but they are coming dangerously close to losing the message of the grace of God, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. What that, that's very informative for what we understand about the church and the threats attached to Christians. The biggest, scariest thing in churches is not sin, because we've got the antidote to sin. The biggest threat to churches is losing the antidote. Do you understand? So no other gospel. That is the big idea today, and we're just going to sit in it for a few more minutes because uh, I, there's so many other things that we could say about this text, but I just want to unpack this for a little bit. Uh, no other gospel. How is it that the Galatian churches were potentially going to lose the gospel? How are they losing the medicine? And the answer comes in the next verse, verse 7. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, what that means is there are some false, church, false teachers that are working their way through the Galatian churches. They're doing two basic things. They're trying to discredit the Apostle Paul's ministry. They're trying to attack his credentials as a minister. And the second thing that they're doing is they are perverting the gospel, is what he said. Now, that word, uh, just so you know, I'm not just kind of bending these things to mean whatever it is that I want them to mean. I got the actual Greek to English lexicon entry here. Uh, that word metastrepho in Greek, it's more commonly translated not as pervert, but as to reverse or to turn around. In other words, what the false teachers in Galatian churches are doing is they're reversing the order of the gospel. What does it mean to rever reverse the order of the gospel? Here's what it means. Every man-made religion on the planet reverses the order of the gospel. Every religion other than Christianity in the world says if you do the right things, say the right things, believe the right things, you make the right sacrifices, you pray the right prayers, you sing the right praises, and then maybe God or the gods will love, accept, and bless you. That's every religion. Now, they have different steps, they have different pillars, they have different words, but it's the exact same order every time. Christianity is the exact opposite order. 
In Christianity, it isn't you do good and then maybe God will love, accept, and bless you. In Christianity, it's we love because he first loved us. 1 John 4. In Christianity, it's while you were still sinners, Christ Jesus died for you. That's Romans 8. It's not about what you did that earned God's love. It's about God loving you and then you respond. See, that's the exact opposite order of every world religion. And by the way, what the New Testament tends to overtly state, the Old Testament tends to illustrate. So if you look all the, all the stories of deliverance in the Old Testament, uh, the most famous one probably is the Exodus account, right? Uh, let me ask you this. Is the order of the Exodus, God's people are enslaved in Egypt under Pharaoh, and what God does is he takes them to a mountain and he says, here's the commandments. Obey them. And when you finally obey them good enough and you purify your lives accordingly, then I will liberate you from the slavery of your oppressor. Is that the order of Exodus? No. God sends a crown prince deliverer from a faraway land who comes in and works miracles by which he releases the oppression of Pharaoh's clutches. He passes them through waters that wash away their enemies. And then he, then and only then, once they are fully delivered, then he takes them to Mount Sinai and he says, and here's how you worship and praise. As I have loved you and delivered you, here's how you can love and serve and honor me. Do you see that? That's the order. That's the right order. Every religion in the world reverses that order. And here's, here's the tricky thought. The reason every religion in the world reverses that order is because those religions are made up of human beings. And they do it because the flesh that you have tries to reverse that order. Your entire approach to your identity and your self-image reverses the order. Your entire approach to all of your relationships in life reverses that order. It's the single most dangerous thing in all of our lives is reversing the order of the gospel of, of God's grace. Um, Martin Luther, uh, in, I, I've come to realize, I, I thought it was just a Lutheran thing, and then I studied more beyond Lutheranism and realized, no, everybody in the world recognizes this who studies uh, Bible commentaries. The most influential commentary in the last 2,000 years of the church is the commentary that, the, uh, that Martin Luther writes on Galatians. And in the introduction to Galatians, he explains that we are saved by what he calls a passive righteousness. Now, he originally wrote it in German. The translation that I have is kind of old English, so I did run it through. This is not a direct quote. I ran it through chat GPT to make it a little bit. I said, give me modern English. Give it to me in a way I can understand it. And they put it like this. This exceptional righteousness I'm talking about, which comes from faith, the righteousness that God gives us through Christ, without us having to do anything, it's very different from political or ceremonial righteousness or from the righteousness demanded by God's law. It's not about our actions. Instead, it's a completely passive righteousness. In this case, we don't do anything ourselves or offer anything to God. Now, understand this correctly. He's not saying Christians never do anything. He's saying in the realm of salvation, Christians don't do anything. It's entirely God's gift. It's entirely God's work. Instead, we simply receive and allow God to work in us. That's why I prefer to call this faith-based or Christian righteousness a passive righteousness. And he closes, this righteousness is somewhat of a mystery not fully understood by the world or even by Christians themselves. Amen. And especially hard to grasp during times of temptation. Amen again. That's why it needs to be taught carefully and practiced consistently. Anyone who doesn't understand or grasp this righteousness during times of trouble and inner turmoil is bound to be defeated. There is no greater comfort for the conscience than this passive righteousness. You understand what he's saying? Martin Luther is saying the way that you get saved is passive righteousness. Jesus Christ paid for your sins on the cross. Jesus Christ gifted to you, theologians say, he imputed righteousness. Uh, and God did it completely based on his undeserved love for you. That is, uh, the, the theological term for that is justification. God declares us not guilty ahead of time simply because of his goodness, simply because of his work, irrespective of who you are or what you've done. And that's exactly what you and me and everybody else in the world needs, and that is exactly what everything in a fallen world is trying to reverse the order of. 
everything's trying to reverse that order. Um, in Paul's day, in the Galatian churches, it was this group called the Judaizers. And the Judaizers, scholars refer to them as that. They're, they're Jewish converts to Christianity who recognized that Jesus was the promised Messiah. They got that right. But they nonetheless said that everybody, Jew and Gentile alike, still had to keep observing the Jewish ceremonial laws in order to be a true believer. And the apostles, Paul said, I can't get with that. You know? Uh, you, you are spitting in the medicine the moment you add anything to Jesus. And then it contaminates everything. So it was the Judaizers in Paul's day. Uh, but what I'm going to tell you is that moving forward, look, not only is it the fact that every world religion reverses the order of the gospel, but also within Christianity, because Christianity is full of fallen Christians, we reverse the order too. I'm going to give you an example or a couple examples of what this looks like. Okay, so in, let's say in liberal churches... Liberal churches reverse the order of the gospel. You know how? I've heard it straight from the mouths of ministers in liberal churches that they'll say, you know what? Jesus is Lord and Savior. And he's loving and he's wise and he's good, but we mustn't ever tell anybody how they should go about living their preferred lifestyle because that would be unloving. And for that matter, we mustn't ever tell anybody who belongs to a different, uh, different religion that they're on some kind of wrong path because maybe they, maybe, They've just found God in a different way. They just use different terms. They've just found a different kind of whatever. No. My response to that is no, because at that point, what you're presuming is that that person is functioning as their own, one, Lord, that gets to call the moral shots in their lives, and two, their own Savior, which means that they're right with God on the basis of whatever religious observances they're performing. That is not the gospel. That's another gospel, which in other words is no gospel at all. Uh, I'm not picking on liberal churches. Conservative churches do this, too, in other ways. Like, to their credit, I think conservative, theologically conservative churches tend to get the order between justification and sanctification right, better, more likely. Uh, at the same time, one of the things that, it, it, the issue is in practice, and the issue is in attitude. In a lot of theologically conservative churches, you end up with, uh, like, a wild amount of criticism and Phariseeism and legalism and condescending attitude and stuff like that. I have seen, I mean, I've seen entire Facebook groups dedicated to condescending Phariseeism and they think, the, the wild thing is they think they're actually glorifying God in the process. And uh, you know what? Here's, here's how it works. They know, like if they took a test, they would say, I'm saved by Jesus Christ. But deep down inside, you can tell by their attitude and you can tell by their language that deep down inside what they really believe is, yes, it's Jesus, but I also think that I look a certain way, talk a certain way, dress a certain way, worship a certain way, and then I also avoid certain movies and I avoid certain drinks and I avoid certain foods and I avoid certain music, and therefore I'm more deserving of God's love than somebody else. They would never tell you that, but deep down inside, when they interact and when they make criticisms of everybody else, you can tell that's exactly what they believe. And uh, that's a different gospel, which is no gospel at all. The reason they have such a condescending attitude is they haven't discovered what the freedom of grace yet actually is. It's no gospel. Uh, so what we have in these instances, what did Luther say? The, the justification is the doctrine by which the Christian church stands and falls. It is the load-bearing doctrine of Christianity. And if it is, in fact, the load-bearing doctrine of Christianity and you order things rightly, you know what that also means? It means that if you get justification right, technically speaking, you can be wrong about the sacraments. You can be wrong about conversion. You can be wrong about uh, church governance. You can be wrong about the relationship between the church and the state. You can be wrong about spiritual gifts. You can be wrong about the end times. You can be wrong about creation. And you can still be a Christian. Sh uh, shocking that a minister would even say that, right? We could, I'm telling you what, we confess it every week when we confess a creed. When we talk about the larger church... Um, liberal churches, what they tend to miss is they think you can also be wrong about the first thing, about justification, and still be a believer. And the Bible says no. Conservatives think not only do you have to be right about justification, you have to be right about secondary and tertiary doctrines too in order to be saved. And it's like, no. The Bible says no. 
Justification is the doctrine by which the Christian church stands and falls. You have to get it in the right order. You lose everything. You contaminate everything, right? Uh, by the way, so it's going to sound a little bit like I'm speaking out of both sides of my mouth because I just said a minute ago, you theoretically can be wrong about a bunch of different things and still be a believer. And unfortunately, if somebody would clip a soundbite of that, uh, and like Pastor Hines said, the sacraments don't matter and conversion doesn't matter and roles of men and women don't, and like, no. I'm saying for salvation. In fact, one of the reasons, one of the primary reasons why I'm a confessional Lutheran is I believe that confessional Lutheranism historically emphasizes the doctrine of justification as primary better than any other church historically. And therefore, let me, let me point it like this. If justification is the doctrine by which the Christian church stands and falls, and if justification means God moves, and then we respond, we love only because he first loved us, then if that's primary and you're letting justification influence the way you interpret every other doctrine that you believe, then you have to interpret every doctrine through the lens of justification. What does that look like? Let's say, for instance, the sacraments. When you look at the sacraments, baptism, Holy Communion, look at all the Bible passages about baptism. Do they talk at all about salvation? Do they talk at all about forgiveness? Do they talk at all about eternal life? Do they talk about salvation? Uh, when is your salvation or my salvation ever primarily about what you or I do? Never. And therefore, when I look, and there's a decent amount of confusion, I think, in the Christian world regarding the doctrine of baptism, but there's different ways of looking at it. So either, either we come to God and make our profession of faith to God, and then God blesses that, or God comes down to and in us, and then we respond after that. If I'm interpreting things in light of the doctrine of justification where God moves and then we respond, I have to go with the latter one because it pertains to salvation and in salvation actions, God always moves first and then we respond. The exact same thing is true when it comes to Holy Communion. Look at the verbiage in the texts. Does it talk about salvation? Does it talk about forgiveness? Does it talk about eternal life? If it talks about salvation, when is our salvation ever primarily about something that you or I do? It's not. It's God's action, and only then do we respond to it. Do you understand? This, this maybe becomes even a little bit clearer when you go into the realm of like uh, other things other than the sacraments, like conversion. When you go into the realm of conversion, uh, when I was down in, um, when I ministered down in the South for a year, and uh, I had a lot of, this is my vicar year, it was more than any other time in my life that I hear people talk about making their decisions for Jesus, and and uh, accepting Jesus Christ in my heart and all of that. Um, and what I would say, by the way, Lutherans sometimes like to get really uh, police language. Um, look, don't be so hard when people talk about making their decisions for Christ. <laughs> like, that's it. I hope and pray you make decisions for Christ. You know, every day if the Holy Spirit has entered into your heart, I hope and pray that you are honoring Christ and making decisions for Christ and accepting the will of Christ. The, the rub is when it comes to conversion. Because if you look at, for instance, what Paul says in Ephesians 2, he says, you were, when you were dead in your sins and transgressions, I made you alive with Christ. How is a corpse ever going to make a decision? It can't. God has to make you alive, and then and only then you can make a decision. Why? Because in acts of salvation, God always moves first. You got to get the order right. Uh, when it comes to spiritual gifting, it's the same way. People will talk, come and say, like, here's, here's how I'm passionate about serving. Here's what I like to do. Here's what... And I'm like, well, wait a second. Who gave you the gifts? Maybe just start with who gives you gifts in the first place, every gift that you have, and see maybe how you can serve his people. Uh, when it comes to roles in men and women, uh, look, I've had people come to me with, like, like, here's my personality profile. I'm like this, and I'm wired this way, and she's that way, and he's that way, and I'm like, oh, okay. Who knit you together in your mother's womb? Male and female, he made them. Like, God moved on you long before you had any concept about taking a personality test. You know? It, doesn't, it means you don't have to like it. You don't have to understand it. You don't have to rationalize it. Uh, but you just have to say, like, this is what God is, and this is what God did, and I want to respond in joy and gratitude to that. Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you understand the point in all of this? 
Justification is not only the doctrine by which the Christian church stands and falls, it is the doctrine by which you interpret everything else in Scripture. I'm actually going to push it one step further. It's not only the doctrine by which the church stands and falls, it's not only the doctrine by which you interpret every other doctrine in Scripture, it is the doctrine by which you interpret everything in your life. It should be grace and justification. It is the lens through which you look at your romantic relationship. It's the lens through which you look at your friendship relationships. It's the lens through which you do your financial management. It's the lens through which you make every major decision in life. Are you able at the end of the day to say, you know what, God has done everything needful already for me. Like more than 2,000 years ago, he did everything I would need. He's everything needful he has already provided. Everything needful he has already promised. And then you can say, if he's already taken care of me, then now I am free to love and serve others out of myself. Justification is the doctrine by which the church stands and falls. It's the doctrine by which your Christian life stands and falls. Uh, by the way, this is a little bit of a, a side bit, but do you know what the most spiritually annoying thing about you is? It's valuable to know that. Uh, me too. You know what the most spiritually annoying and antagonizing thing is about you? So the Judaizers were inclined to say, Jesus plus uh, obeying the traditional Jewish ceremonial laws equals salvation. My guess is the plus, that blank, that tempta tempting blank, yours just probably isn't traditional Jewish ceremonial laws. Okay? That's probably, that probably ain't you. But I guarantee it's something else. And you generally won't tell people what it is. And you might not even consciously know what it is, but it's the things that fire you up and trigger you the most. Uh, it's the thing that whatever, Jesus plus whatever that thing is that you think means salvation. Um, <laughs> if, if, think about it like this. If you were a prisoner of war and somebody was torturing you and they're like, well, how are you saved? And you say, Jesus Christ alone. But they're, they're like professional torturers. So they're trying to break you down psychologically, okay? So they, they tie you to a chair and they throw water in your face so that you can't fall asleep like cold water. And it's like day four. And they're, Jesus plus what? I know it's Jesus plus something. I know you got to do it. It's Jesus plus something. What is it going to be? And it's like, ah, Jesus plus conservative politics. Or, or, Jesus plus what? Not watching R-rated movies. Uh, something. It's something. You know it's something. Deep down, whatever that thing is, you would be so much healthier and so much freer if you could get rid of the something. Repent of the something. Let it just be Jesus. Let it just be Jesus. And therefore, the most important thing, get the order right. Get the order of the justification right. God moves, you and I then respond. I've, over the years, a lot of people, I mean right now, a lot of people, a lot of you have come to me and talked about like certain things I'm struggling with, certain bad habits, certain things I'd like to break. And your first instinct, whenever somebody wants to break bad habits, their first instinct is to say, I'm going to try harder, right? Um, the problem with that is your will is what took you down a bad road. So by ratcheting up your willpower, you're just throwing fuel on the fire that pushed you down a bad road. It's actually not ratcheting up your will. It's repenting of your will and authority and autonomy over your life. So what I do with people in those moments is I'll tell them, you know what you really need to do? You need to praise, praise Jesus more. And they're like, well, I go to church every week. I'm like, you're, you're still missing it because you're talking about church like it's just a box that you check on the weekend. Okay? I need you to praise Jesus more. I need you to stand in awe and wonder that the God of the universe chose you died for you, and has a spot in heaven for you. If your jaw hasn't hit the ground yet, it's got to hit the ground. And lo and behold, when people get to praise Jesus better for what he's already done, shockingly, a power of the Spirit sometimes comes into their life by which it helps them navigate the other things of life better. Get the order right, okay? Okay? The best thing you will ever be, everything that you have, everything that you are, everything that you ever will be is wrapped up entirely for what Jesus has already done for you. Everything that you're looking forward to in the future has already been provided for by the one whose hand holds the stars in the sky. Uh, the one opinion in the entire universe that actually matters when he looks at you through the righteousness of Jesus Christ he sees you as breathtakingly beautiful. I'm not telling you what you should be. 
I'm not telling you what you should do. That's just good news to you. And it isn't until the pre-approval of Christ lands in your heart that you're going to have a healthy relationship with everything else in this world. Let's ask God to help us. Lord Jesus, uh, in the text, I'm blown away by how confident the Apostle Paul is. He says, he talks about uh, potentially cursing angels or even calling curses upon himself if anyone tries to teach another gospel. Paul has never spoke more confidently. And the reason that he's confident is because he's so certain of justification. He's so certain of your love and grace. And actually, when we become more certain of justification, we don't just get more certain of our salvation. We get more confident about everything else in life because our life becomes rightly ordered. I'm asking as you move us forward, help us to be more more courageous, more bulletproof to criticism, more humble, and more confident in knowing exactly who we are because it's what you, by grace, have made us. May it glorify your name. Amen.